thank you, Fernando. Thank you, the speakers, for these inspiring presentations. So um, it's open for questions. So that's what I'm supposed to do here. Just coordinate, please, Luis. Yeah, I have a question, Andrew. Yes. Uh, oh, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. You mentioned interventions in Singapore and Spain in the contact with the respective ministries of education. I was very curious about that. What kind of implication is that? How many uh, children are involved in that? How schools are involved? And uh, what's the span of time uh, of the duration of this implication? What, what is it? Right. So we're just beginning those now. We're going to be going over in the fall to Spain. And uh, Spain has these very powerful stereotypes, as in America, about math being for boys, and, uh, and the scores in math are not as high as they want them to be. So we're actually now, we've been working over the six months to design better and better interventions, and we, we're doing those studies in Seattle. So we don't have them all fixed at the moment, but uh, some of them have to do with social manipulations. Of, we, we're finding in Seattle that if you make teams where, where uh, people think they're part of a math team, the children will be more motivated to participate in math than if they believe they're doing it individually. So we're doing some uh, experiments where we have the kids wear a certain color t-shirt and show other pictures of kids on the wall with the same color t-shirt. And we say, those people are on the math team and these are on the reading team. You have this t-shirt, you're on the math team. and talk about that, and then it turns out that they will play the math games for longer. This is just a social psychology effect. They play the math games for longer and persist on more difficult problems for longer if they think they're part of a group that does it rather than if they think they're an individual who does it. It's just a social psychology effect. So we're trying to urge children through various these various interventions to uh, want to engage and choose mathematical games, and we're in the middle of designing those. There's other ones about pulling math problems toward you and pushing other things away, that it turns out that that sensory motor involvement for young ch kids make them more interested in the problem. It's an odd effect, but it's one that says this is, this is more like me, more connected with me. So. Uh, the process of interventions is design ones based on psychological effects, <clears throat> pilot study it in Seattle, and then bring it to a country where we can, we're going to be testing about 1,000 kids, 500 in uh, controls and 500 experimentals. And because we're working with the Ministry of Education, we're allowed to go into the same schools and randomly assign classes, some classes to our experimental group, to others to control. That's very difficult to do unless you have participation of the Ministry of Education. So we're trying to do the right intervention study, and uh, with the cooperation of the government, it's quite helpful to do. Eliana, please. Um, thank you for both of you for the fantastic lectures. I was wondering, it's very clear cut, the results on math, but what's your hypothesis for the increase in the curve of biology as well as chemistry. Why? Uh -huh. Why so this has been more women. Because we have similar results in Brazil, except for chemistry. In mm -hmm. chemistry, we still have less women, less female going to, into chemistry. Mm -hmm. But biology and medicine, it's beginning even to be the opposite. Too much female in terms of, instead of male. What would be the psychological explanation for that? Right. Well, in America, we have many more people in psychology now hmm. who are female. Now it's 80% of psych. I'm a minority. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Me neither. Uh, <laughs> but when I started out. Yeah, when I started out, females were not supposed to be able to do psychology either. So one easy hypothesis is, is that the fields that have to do with interpersonal, biological, or with other people, 
females are uh, gravitate towards that, but that's, I'm not saying that's a genetic or biological thing. I'm saying among the STEM disciplines that females are first drawn into or attracted to are the mind, interpersonal relations, perhaps biological, and that it spreads from there to perhaps chemistry then to more you know, to other ones in physics and engineering. So we, we'll be able to see whether the spread is in that direction or not. I think what was, what's important is that all sciences were highly stereotypically male not so long ago. And so it can, it can change, right, it, yeah. can, it can have hope, yeah. So well, uh, very nice uh, conference for both uh, presentations. Uh, I have two questions. One is uh, about the language. If uh, learning English and Spanish or English and, and Chinese, for instance, would have the same result as far as the decision-making process is uh, con uh, considered. And the second one is about counting, the, the, this box counting and the, the notion of numbers. Uh, my question is uh, uh, if animals have the same ability and if it's possible to make comparison about the neurosciences and how the brains work. I'll ask the first one, you do the second one yes. about counting in, in animals. So uh, the first one is at the moment, th there is a difference about whether the languages are related. Obviously, Romance languages are more related than we are to Chinese. Um, and that makes it you know, easier to learn languages that are, that are more closely related. But I'm not aware of any research at the moment that says learning two diverse languages versus closer languages has differential effect on executive function. It's an, actually quite an interesting hypothesis because I suppose the farther apart the languages are, the more of a switch, the more of a completely different symbolic representation it is to label the same thing. And whereas with languages are close, it's not completely different. But I'm not aware that anybody has tested that. It's quite interesting. And, and he was an expert on the yeah, The answer is yes. Uh, we share this uh, capacity with animals. Uh, in many animals, we have tested that. In monkeys, for sure. In dolphins also. In bees, I think. Mm -hmm. If you want to look more uh, for the difference of the rates, uh, because monkeys are a little uh, faster, but not so good or whatever, you can look at uh, Christian Agrillo. He's an Italian uh, researcher who uh, make this kind of research uh, in many different animals. But the answer is yes, we share that. Please. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on the uh, sex differences and interventions to increase the number of women in STEM fields such as chemistry and particularly computer science or, and some branches of engineering where they're hardly un underrepresented. And it's, it's following up on the social thing, but it's a little bit different. This is research by Amanda Diekman, who has found that uh, women want their life to affect other people. That it's, it's social, but they want, part of the meaning is that they do good in the world. So, you know, traditionally being a nurse was a way to do that, but then they realized that they could be a doctor and do that mm -hmm. as well. And some of the interventions, uh, we're working a little bit with the Northwestern University branch of women in computer science, which is a very small club, but growing. Uh, and they have these stories of transformation where they realize that computer science actually matters for society. And so if you can represent the STEM fields as a way to make a difference in the world, I don't know what this is saying about men, they just don't care, but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, women also are, you know, they, they want to make money, they, they want to be successful, but in addition, they also want to make a difference in lives of other people. And if you can show, and these fields very much do, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah. it's, you can do something. It's a very good point. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Okay. So um, my name is Duila Jamalo. I'm an astrophysicist. So I work at NASA in the United States and at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. So I've been listening and learning here quite a bit. Um, I try to do the, the thing of being a role model to uh, girls in, in the U.S. and in Brazil. And um, I find a, a, a strong battle, and um, mostly because of the families. So um, what I would like actually us to reflect upon here 
is how we can work with professors and teachers and families on uh, educating them that girls can do anything they want to do. So um, this is something that is hard to do because uh, women are biased. They, they are adults and they are biased already. So how uh, do the psychologists and our friend from Uruguay can actually um, uh, help us and uh, the impact in the families? So the families, because the children spend 85% with their families and, and societies. How, how can we do that with society? Right. Well, you know, it, do, it does start with the family, and I, I think there's some research, th there's interesting research, because on the one hand, same-sex role models, same-sex matters, so for females to have a strong or good female teacher or role model, on the one hand, has shown to be influential, you know, finding a physics, a female uh, teacher early on. On the other hand, Research, some research shows that the father has a particularly powerful effect on daughters by showing, by as a male in the family, mm -hmm. showing that it's possible to, uh, that males think that you can be a female and a good physicist at the same time, and that fathers play a particularly strong role in encouraging their daughters. So uh, it's mixed. I wouldn't want to say that you need a female role model versus a male role model. I think we don't. We don't know now which would be most powerful. We do know that there are stereotypes in the culture and in American that we need to change, and that's different from changing the family. Uh, in America, there are many T-shirts that say things like, I'm too cute to do math. <laughs> and parents buy that for their little children, their three-year-olds and four-year-olds, who are very cute, but the little girls in pigtails, when they're walking around with a t-shirt that says, I'm too cute to do math, that cannot be good for them. Uh -huh. um, and so that's a place in the, in the culture that cutting back the stereotypes that girls don't do math on television, in products that we have, the Barbie dolls that we have used to be, there was yes. a Barbie doll in America that when you had the Barbie doll and pull, pulled the string, it said, I hate math, I hate math. <laughs> so those are things, I don't know that we want to make laws against it, but we want to somehow make it not be productive economically that you have these highly, highly stereotyped messages. Families, I think, are harder to change because parents can raise the children the way their family values are, and as long as there's a generational difference, there still will be families who don't treat their girls okay. as doing STEM. Uh, just one, can I add one more, in, one ingredient more to this uh, point? Is that as you just mentioned about toys? So, uh, toy industries is is against us. So, because I remember that here in Brazil, and I guess that's all around the world, we have like a, 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 a very inter intelligent and interesting toy that's engineering blocks. That it's so we, I mean, so it's only dedicated to to boys. So mm. it's kind of strange if you give like a, these engineering blocks to, to a, a girl. to a girl. And also, you see when you enter in a store that that you know, sells toys like pink in one side, and yeah. so you know pants and you know, oven and things to the. So how can we change like the Lego? So it's such a fantastic toy. You have so split. You no, know, this is Legos for boys, and so we don't have something that can mix. You no, know, and can so toys. I guess that we have to to have the toys with us in, instead of against us. So how we can use this industry to to change well, a little bit this concept? No, I think, so maybe you can talk about the, uh -huh. the laptops from toy, but in a second, in the toy point Sorry, of I'm view, gonna... um, I think we, in America there are more and more opportunities now for manufacturing and making girl STEM related games because uh, people understand that the market is very un underrepresented, right? So it has been very stereotyped about girls and yes. pink and feathers and glitter. Uh -huh. And boys a... have spatial games and blocks and robots and things. Uh, but now there's there's the opportunity of building STEM games for girls, and there's a big there's a growing market of that in America. So I would just say a thing that scientists can do is raise the awareness 
that these stereotypes are affecting our children early. As a yes. psychologist doing that research, I don't make the toys, but I can get the message exactly. out that it's our children can... are affected much earlier than we thought. Yes. Second grade, before they learn multiplication, what father in the room or what toy manufacturer wants their second grade girl thinking, girls don't do math, girls is for boys, you know? Mm -hmm. So then if psychologists show that it makes a difference, then there are some toy manufacturers, business people who say, well, there's a big market here, nobody is making STEM toys for girls, I will do that, yeah. right? Yes. But we don't make them. But your laptop No, I, I think that we have to also to, to start up uh, projects to yes. make toys. I, I, I would like to, I mean, of course, if you're a scientist, maybe you don't have time to, to develop a startup project or whatever, but yes. sometimes you could uh, just push these kind of ideas and, and, and develop toys or games yes. or, uh, I think the software companies uh, yes. would have to work more together to the scientists. Startups company, you know, just Something filling like these holes. Yes. So I, we have several hands on, so Please. Okay, thank you for the lectures. So I want to know uh, of Andrew. Um, I have two questions. You can choose which one you want to answer. Uh, if uh, you believe that it's difference between girls and boys, if the research, brain's research show us something interesting between the function of the brain, okay, and how they can uh, influence in the, stem, in the STEM learning, and if you heard about uh, the learning styles and how these styles, those styles can uh, influence in the STEM, STEM learning too. Right, so I think you asked about differences in brain and, and, and styles. Those are the two things. So, you know, there are developmental psychologists who are very interested in this question. And I just want to say something about, about the brain research. You know, if you do research with a three-year-old little girl and brain and three-year-olds little boys and you find out, if you found out, that boys were better in spatial rotation, which is something that there is reasonable evidence that at, in adults, men, men are better in spatial rotation than, than females. Is that reasonable? That's not mathematics. It's recognizing patterns in spatial rotation. Um, if you find that there's a difference in the brains of three-year-olds, there's a big tendency to say it's in the brains, it's bio brains are biological, and therefore there's a genetic difference between male and female. The difficulty is that we know an awful lot from brain science that brains are sculpted by experience starting even earlier, even in infancy. So language research shows that the influence of the language you're bathed in changing your brain uh, in 12-month-olds and 15-month-olds. So the point I want to make is that just because you find brain differences, it does not mean in the strong sense that it's genetic or innate when you're finding it in 5-year-olds or 3-year-olds or 2-year-olds, or even if you did an experiment with 1-year-olds and found a brain difference, if you then go to the homes and you find out that the toys that the girls are being exposed to, the boys are being exposed to are different, you could be creating those brain changes early on. So the only studies that will be able to tell us about genetics and intrinsic differences are animal studies that were raised earlier with selective rearing or studies of brains much earlier than we typically do them. So I'm just, I'm counseling us not to find brain results with three-year-olds and say, aha, girls are different than, than boys. Um, of course, there are biological differences between girls and boys, mm -hmm. fortunately. We all <laughs> got yeah. here somehow. Yeah. So there are biological differences, and we cannot dismiss yes. biological differences either. Uh, it's just, if there are biological differences, it doesn't, it's going to not be in something as broad as STEM as has been illustrated by biology and chemistry, right? I mean, it's not that girls don't do logical thinking, don't do hypothesis testing, don't generate hypotheses and predictions, and then design experiments to empirically test that. There's no reason to believe there's, there's a difference between males and females in that. There may be domain differences. Sorry. 
No, no, no. I, I, just to know. I'm worried because my plane is leaving at 1 from the airport. I don't know the distance and even the time. So if you said that it's okay, I can stay. <laughs> It's a race to stay. Okay, so I'm going. <laughs> no, I cannot. So anyway, sorry for that. It's, it's not my fault. Have shown us the small time we, we spend in formal education. Yes. But uh, for young children, we, they spend a lot of time in television. So should we not pay more attention to television? It's a sensible point because we, it's, it's a question of liberty, freedom, and information. But I think for young people, it's really important. And, and so the question is, should uh, uh, tele yes. they're spending time with television? And yes, the question exactly. was, how can you use television? How can you use? Yeah. Yes, it's since they spend so many. So much, yeah, much time it's very interesting, TV. isn't it? So there is research. Uh, I'll just make a distinction between the very youngest children and slightly older. Just a new piece of research to bring in here. There has been a lot of research about whether television can be used to teach another, a second language in the first two years of life. When people have shown the power of bilingualism, of course, in America that's very commercial. As soon as uh, it was actually our lab was showing power of, commer of bilingualism. We got, a, we got phone calls from businesses said they wanted to make DVDs and tape recordings to put on the baby's crib so they babies could hear Spanish all during the day and night and become bilingual by hearing the tape recordings on the crib. And there was some research at our institute seeing whether babies in the first two years of life could learn language from technology, and the answer was no. They did no learning from technology. They needed a person to learn from. So if you played the same foreign language over a tape recorder for the same length of time, or had a person say exactly the same thing as on the tape recorder but in person, the child's brain learned the second language from the human being, from social interaction, but not, did not learn from a tape recording. So that's, there's very interesting stuff about how linguistic uh, information is picked up in a social context early. However, you're also right that five-year-olds, six-year-olds, ten-year-olds are spending a lot of time in front of screen and you, they obviously can learn by screen. They don't have to only learn by people anymore. And so, again, designers of television programs need to decide to make them more educational and not, in America, not as violent uh, television that the kids are watching, um, but use it for education purposes. But I just want to express that for the youngest kids, they learn better from people than from television. I'll say one other thing that's anecdotal. David made me speak about this. I speak to engineering and professors at, at the University of Washington and they're suggesting that they're finding a, suggesting that they're finding a decline in the intuitions that students have about physics and pulleys and levers and forces and engineering concepts now versus 20 years ago and some of the speculation, but not evidence, speculation is that the children are spending so much time in impossible worlds on two-dimensional tablets that violate physics that our everyday intuitions that children used to pick up by playing with three-dimensional objects and just playing and manipulating them, that that may make a difference in, in those um, disciplines later. Now that's mm -hmm. anecdotal, but if that's true, it's a frightening thought of the ch our 21st century children all paying attention to screens and you know not realizing that when I knock this over that it's going to fall rather than it's going to float up on the screen. So <laughs> there's a lot of hours in the physical world of understanding how things work that will not be gathered by watching television. And that could be frightening. Yes, that's true. Professor. Well, <clears throat> maybe I miss it, but uh, some points, but uh, uh, 
something that I didn't hear from either of you is that some competition and some kind of prize with good taste may help uh, to create good symbols. Isn't that so? Good. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't hear from... That's some, David, did you get that? To introduce the competition. Competition right? in the children? Yeah, and some real warning. Yeah. Well, um, there is evidence that some mixture of social, social, the brain and the children learn very well in social settings, but social settings don't always have to be cooperative. They can be competition too, if that's what you're raising. And some level of competitiveness, as long as it's social, may very well help, you know, promote stuff with children. From my point of view, from what we're finding out about the power of social, I would just say that that's different from putting the child alone in isolated problem solving when they're too young. They do quite well in competition with their brothers and sisters, in competition in school, but they respond well to, to sort of social settings, maybe doing better than others, but the brain is wired for social things. I so because we have one hands up there and you and I guess that we we run out of time because we have a coffee break. Can can you continue discussion during the coffee? We do a work with Girl Scouts on competition, and it works really well because we don't have to play with girls. We stimulate the competition. It's about competition. Uh -huh. Okay, so sorry, Marila, so you can, you can continue discussion. So once again, let's thank okay. Professor Andrew for the wonderful discussion.